So first of all, that you can see that um, in the backgrounds, there's some um, banners going on. And these yeah. are the links to our um, new um, master specialization for the popular music, sound and media cultures uh, master specialization here at Berug. Um, and yeah, now I'd like to invite uh, Kristen Mickey, Dr. Kristen Mickey, who is a musicologist and professor here at the University of Groningen, who is also former chair of ISPM Benelux and one of the co-organizers co of the Music Matters Conference series, um, of which this keynote lecture is also part of. Um, thank you so much for being here today, and I'll give the word to you, Kristen. Great, thank you so much, Nora. Thank you, Dr. Tonelli. Thank you, all the students of EASPM who organized such a fascinating conference today, and you made it intimate and friendly and engaging, and you allowed for some great conversations even in our, in our distance online environment. So thank you all for a wonderful day. And now I'm so thrilled to introduce Dr. Kira Gant, so honored, we feel so lucky. I wanna give you just a few points about our program, which has allowed the Music Matters Colloquium to occur, which allows us to invite such amazing scholars such as Dr. Gant today. And Music Matters is the colloquium, which is embedded in the broader program of popular music, media and culture studies in this department. And we have a great MA program, and we also have a PhD program so I put some links up there. If you wanna check out our program, feel free to do that at any moment. I also put in two links which are relevant for Dr. Gant's lecture today because she has this amazing book, which I think everyone should be required to read. I put the link for that book there. And then finally, a fantastic TED Talk, which is just skyrocketing in the numbers of the YouTube environment. You can also check out her tech TED Talk there. So just wanted to get those links out there before I introduce you. So welcome, Dr. Gant. Um, the program today is motivated by a desire to take popular music culture seriously, especially at the intersections of sound and media, and so your topic, Dr. Gant, it couldn't be more relevant for introducing the necessity of engaging with digital culture in ways that foreground the complex processes guiding the reception and uses of musics of various cultural groups, including those less represented within the dominant structures of the music industry, especially black girls within the United States. Your examples today, all you students from Eurodance to Brazilian hip hop to hip hop in Brussels, to the political rallies of Poland or the folkloric revitalizations of Romanian music have all engaged with these complexities in ways relevant to such local and global or global context. So I've known Dr. Gant mostly online, but also through the conferences of ethnomusicology. We're both card carrying ethnomusicologists it's an expanding world, thank goodness. It's one that's finally responded to the critical musicology of scholars such as Dr. Gaunt, and she's been important for spearheading the field to open up for new voices and bringing especially black feminist voices to the fore with the study of music in culture. In her groundbreaking research, Gaunt uses song, scholarship, and digital media dis to disclose disconnects in music, culture, and technology that perpetuate violence against girls online. And that's where you can go to the link. Her first book, The Games Black Girls Play, Learning the Ropes from Double Dutch to Hip Hop, which came out in 2007, and subsequent publications have contributed significantly to the emergence of what we now know as hip hop studies and black girlhood studies, and also hip hop feminism. The games Black Girls Play also contributed to the emergence of Black girlhood studies outside of academia, which is really an important point today because of course we're all engaging with digital media through the academy, but we, we see it in many other ways. And it's inspired Black girls and women of color to produce socially and culturally engaged music and theater performances and dance within the digital archive. Um, one example is the choreographic work Black Girl Linguistic play by Camille Brown and dancers. And it was nominated for the 2016 Bessie Award for Outstanding Production was staged at the Joyce Theater, as well as the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. And beyond her writings, Gaunt has an extensive and important media presence. So she's been featured in the viral TED video, How the Jump Rope Got Its Rhythm. Uh, it's been actually screened in 28 different languages. So you can also check that out. That's one of the links, check it out. Um, 
Her article, The Magic of Black Girls Play, was an editor's pick in the New York Times in July of 2020. So I'm hoping her lecture today will foreshadow her upcoming project entitled Played, Twerking at the Intersection of Music, YouTube, and Violence Against Black Girls. Personally, Gant's work has influenced the curriculum here, even in Groningen in the northern parts of Europe. And whenever we read your chapter, the students always have quite passionate debates. So I know it's a good work because it stimulates critical and, and interesting and, and very impassioned debates. And as it will in the coming week with students who are here today, we're discussing your text next week. Finally, Gant is not only an outstanding ethnomusicologist and black hip hop feminist, but also an accomplished classical music, R&B and jazz vocalist. We're so lucky to welcome you, Dr. Gant, to Groningen today, and we hope this Music Matters keynote lecture will inspire a lively debate to close today's engaging and diverse student conference in popular music. Thank you, Kira, for being here today. The screen speakers and our ears and eyes are yours. And I think if it, yeah, there, your mic Hold is. Hold on, my, my screen doesn't share. Take your time. Share. Yeah. It's saying, I, it's saying I can't share, share my screen, and I don't understand why. Oh, we need to make you a host, I guess. Is, oh, is Dr. maybe. Is Dr. the host? Oh, okay, now I see there it. There we go. Stop sharing this tab, no. Can you, can you see anything? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, it looks great. Oh, okay, wonderful, wonderful. First of all, Thank you so much. Um, I know we're millions of miles apart across the ocean, um, uh, but uh, I've been in the territory there. It's been quite a while, maybe 2011. And um, I'm sure, because I saw a few faces before we got, I am so proud that I got Google bombed. <laughs> um, it's my first, it was a virgin day um uh because it is a sign of uh how important um um you know why people want to interrupt discourse says something about the times that we're living in um and so i try to not take it so um with, with a, a, a grain of salt um but i'm so uh delighted to be here and i the introduction was very very um, heartwarming for me. I so appreciate it. And um, I'm going to dive in because I know we're starting a bit late. Um, I should tell you that uh, I'm, a, I'm a daredevil before, before, before presentations. I often have a brain spurt. And so I try to uh, go with that flow. Um, and so I'm going to test out some new tracks within the work. Um, and so some things may not fall completely in line, but I hope they'll kind of coagulate in the end. Um, uh, I'm also just uh, a week out of ankle surgery, so um, I haven't been as mobile as normal, um, which isn't a big deal during the pandemic. <laughs> um, so um, I got my recording on. Uh, I just want to uh, tell you that I'm uh, to give a land acknowledgement here. Um, I highly recommend if you have not seen the HBO, uh, if, if you can stomach it, the HBO um, series called Exterminate the Brutes by uh, director Raul Peck that's on HBO, that's airing on HBO right now. So in, inside of that, I want to acknowledge the land on which I stand and the University at Albany is part of the Haudenosaunee tribe uh, of Hiawatha fame and, and many others. Um, and uh, this is both the region just below Toronto in Canada, um, uh, or Montreal that is in Canada, and um, also the uh, Mohawk Nation is near here. Um, so uh, last month was Sexual Assault Awareness Month here in the United States, Child Abuse Awareness Month, Trans Awareness Month, um, and um, I'm calling forth, of course, the Me Too movement and uh, the anti-Asian hate um, social justice efforts to try and combat the kinds of you know, rampant 
forms of violence from emotional to physical that we are experiencing around the world. And it may have something to do with the kind of origins of the taking of lands. So the talk is Music is Violence Against Black Girls on YouTube or Twerking at the Intersection. Um, I want to start with uh, 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 a letter to your body. Because <laughs> um, this talk is trying to pull together issues about sound and affect, physiology and public health, um, and also an ecological fitness, which I won't talk about much today, but the idea that, for example, when I go to work out at my boutique fitness center here in New York State, that is open around the world, it's called Orange Theory Fitness, some of you may know it, um, they play music. And that music often assaults not only my ears, um, because it's way above 87 decibels, which you should only listen to music for more than a minute to, to five minutes at that, at, at anything over that. But it also assaults the um, representation of bodies that look like mine, black women's bodies with big butts or big asses, um, big hips. Um, and the music that is replayed usually via Spotify playlists very, through various apps um in boutique fitness centers like like orange theory fitness is forever so a song like baby god back which may not have its intro oh my god becky look at her but she must be one of those rapper girlfriends or something is talking about women like me and since 1992 um that music though it was intended to laud black women's bodies because that introductory passage um, denigrates Black females and their bodies. Um, that's the thing that keeps getting repeated um, at the dinner table with friends and my eight-year-old friend's twins when I'm staying with them for an extended period of time. And I'm like, will I ever be free of this sonic assault? And so this is very much behind the work I'm doing. Um, the music as an instrument of violence that I have decided to focus on in my work is about grooming and I would say gaslighting. And the idea that music is priming psychologically and cognitively, linguistically and physiologically, women and girls of all backgrounds, men and women, both as well and particularly as very young black girls who play online in musical spaces like YouTube or TikTok. And by grooming, I mean when, uh, and grooming can happen at any age. It's not, uh, it's a power-based kind of uh, coercion and violence um, where you get special attention, perhaps because of your body. Um, you're isolated from other people. That's everyone on their mobile devices. Uh, it fills a need. There is such a, dearth of, or, or perhaps there is a perception that there is a dearth of self-esteem among black children. Um, here we go. <laughs> Okay, so Josh left us. Uh, Kira, go on, please continue, sorry. I really tried to keep all the trolls out. <laughs> Kira, your mic, your mic is muted. Kira, your mic is muted, I think, somehow. Not how, she, yeah. Yes, yes, I, I must have inadvertently done that. Uh, thank you. So I'm used to trolls. Um, and perhaps we're all being gaslit and groomed in a sort. So I was saying the grooming, the signs of grooming can happen across the lifespan to anyone because it's power-based violence. Um, it fills a void of a lack of feeling connected. Um, it fills a void for a lot of people in general who do not feel the kind of touch. Um, I would call it touch hunger or skin hunger that we so um, uh, 
personally got acquainted with this last year because of the pandemic, but was already there before the quarantine hit, that we're not touched enough. Um, we don't connect enough. We don't feel the breath of voice because we're always texting one another. Um, and that music is the dominant mode of discourse, I would say, more than any other, perhaps more than visual communication when it comes to our mobile devices. So it can serve as a device for exposing us to sexist and misogynoir in the music that we listen to, much like what epigenetics do to study the intergenerational trauma by putting a mouse next to a cat in a box and seeing how their cortisone spike, cortisol spikes and how long it lasts when they're no longer exposed to the predator. So this idea of prey and predator is very important to the work I do. So I'm gonna start with a, uh, a video right off the bat that you can see this from um, my data set of about 650 videos of tween and teen girls twerking. The data set was collected um, in 2014 among 90 of my undergraduate students and I. Uh, we did a kind of um, sample where we collected about 10 videos every week uh, for a four-week period in various sections of uh, cultural anthropology courses that I was teaching at the time. Um, the data set spans each of the videos is about two to five minutes long with anywhere from zero views, which means that a girl uploaded it without looking at it, to uh, just under 100,000 views. Now, this is in comparison to, say, a random video of white girls twerking that has five million views. So you can see a kind of disparity in the kinds of um, attention um, and engagement this content receives on YouTube. And they were uploaded as early as 2006 through 2014, which places them um, before Miley Cyrus and Katie. <laughs> We have a Brazilian connection. Uh, that's a great way to talk about Brazilian butt lifts, but I won't. Um, so this is uh, two girl, three girls playing, um, aged nine, in their bedroom, to a song called Red Nose. And uh, I have uh, put a filter on this so that I protect their identity here. Uh-oh. Not getting any sound. Yeah, why is that? Hmm. Uh, let me just see something real quick. Let me go to the next slide and see if this will play. Okay, I'm not getting any. Are you guys hearing this? Anybody give me a vocal tag? I hear, we hear the, we hear that one, yeah, but not the first yeah. one. Okay, so this is the music that, <laughs> that's not the music. <laughs> yeah, hold on. I, I don't know how this person is sharing oh, So sure I just wanna. So so this is a this is a good place to. Uh, uh, years ago, when we used to before the tech tech issues that we have online, when I used to play a um, video cassette and the new video players wouldn't allow it to play. This was one day in class when I was teaching at NYU. Um, and then this DVD bootleg I got wouldn't play in the DVD recorder. Um, and it was just a snafu, a day of snafus. And one of my students, this woman named Eleanor, who was Russian, is a long story, <laughs> why I know her name. Um, she was like, I can't believe you're so like calm. Like nothing worked today. So I wanna offer you that being calm in the face of this is a good thing. Uh, don't let it rattle you. Um, there's something about, you know, carrying yourself gracefully in the face of all of these interruptions and allowing the dis distractions that you are quite used to. If you've been on TikTok lately or on stories, you're used to being constantly interrupted. So it's interesting to note that it's disturbing when you really need to pay attention. Oh. <laughs> and there it is. He has multiple accounts now. <laughs> so, 
So uh, I'm going to read from my uh, maybe. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I cannot block him. I keep reporting him for abuse and he keeps entering and I think he has multiple screens open. So he's very adamant to interrupting us. And can you? Hold on. Let me, let me I don't know if you can make others hosts, Nora, but we could help you if you could make others hosts, but I don't know if that's possible. I don't think that's possible, unfortunately. I've already tried. Can you help me if we're being Google meet bombed? Question mark. <laughs> I, I'm uh, on a YouTube team. Um, I'm assuming something we could try is um, doing one more Google Meets link and making sure that this uh, that we don't add him there. Let me just uh, dive into the text that I, I want to read to you all. So um, the book, which um, I've been struggling with what the title should be for various reasons. I've been thinking about Groomed from Girlhood, which is a quote from uh, the woman that Dr. Dre brutally beat back in 1990. Her name was Dee Barnes. She was a rapper and a host of a rap show um in on the west coast who is still suffering from the trauma of the violence she experienced in 1990 and she wonders if she was groomed from girlhood um but the title i think i'm going to go with uh at this point is getting played because of the notion of uh the halo effects that happen between sound and media uh on platforms like youtube and TikTok, getting played music as an instrument of violence against black girls or twerking at the intersection of music at the at, as an instrument of violence so getting played reveals the wickedly complex processes at work or at to work the word work uh, twerk comes from to work the body um these complex processes are are at work and can be studied and are apparent from the work that i've been doing for seven years um on black girls. It ex uh, this work exposes how music and tech obscure music as an instrument of violence from children online and from most users of general audience video sharing platforms. Uh, both TikTok and YouTube, um, you may or may not know, was fined in the US by the Federal Trade Commission just before quarantine. Um, for uh, TikTok for $5.7 million and YouTube and Alphabet Google for $170 million, with $70 million of that uh, fine being uh, uh, a case filed by New York State um, for invasion of child online privacy. Um, since that year, 2019, well over 600 hours of video are uploaded every minute. It's probably well over that with uh, the pandemic um, to well over 2 billion unique users every month on YouTube. That too has probably bloomed or blossomed. Um, and over 70% of the traffic that um, comes to US subscribers channels come from outside the United States since at least 2013. 2013 is a pivotal year. Um, it's the year that uh, uh, Billboard and Nielsen ratings turned YouTube views as currency um, towards the Recording Industry Association of America's Gold and Platinum Certifications. Ethnomusicologist Martin Daughtry and feminist musicologist Susan Cusick were among the early scholars to write about music as violence, often in the context of the weaponization of sound in military tactics. Music becomes violent in a war on ter terrorism. It's used as torture, or it was used as torture in Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay, Music was used and still is as sonic force against peaceful protesters, particularly the protests of black bodies and police tactics around Black Lives Matter since 2014. Music is used, uh, music used to be used uh, in the civil rights movement to shield us, where songs were about being truly free and about freedom for all people. But now youth barely know how to freely sing or raise up a song in, uses, in unison at public protests. I've been in many protests for Black Lives Matter and people know how to follow, but they don't know how to raise up a song and they don't know a lot of repertoire of civil rights songs, which I experienced at the Apollo Theater in New York uh, City 
about um, five years ago, when a wonderful artist named Toshi Regan, the daughter of Bernice Johnson Regan, who was one of the original SNCC singers in the civil rights movement, raised up a song and none of the people in the audience at the Apollo, these are young millennials or younger, knew how to sing, wanted to sing along with a, an age old protest song about coming together. So um, this, this um, practice, um, this, this uh, way of coming together through sound and music is, is only palpable if the music is hip hop and is a recorded song, perhaps by Kendrick Lamar and All Right in the protests. Um, there are exceptions, of course, but generally those things aren't documented in ethnomusicology or musicology quite yet. Um, so uh, for Daughtry, uh, Martin Daughtry, the ethnomusicologist, the nature of sound is critical to understanding how music physiologically enacts violence. Quote, we listen not only with our ears, but also with our body. We flinch against loud sounds before the conscious brain begins to try to understand them. It is therefore a mistake to play, pl place, quote unquote, music and violence in separate categories. Sound itself can be a form of violence. Um, Toni Morrison wrote in her Nobel Prize laureate speech about um, the power of words and language as violence as well. Um, it, it limits um, the way we perceive reality. It limits uh, possibilities. We use language as sound or music as sound. It shapes the way that we think about the world and ourselves. So grooming and gaslight I offer, excuse me, grooming and gaslighting I offer are being propagated by our music, particularly mobile mediated music on our personally handheld phones requiring a new kind of ecological fitness that is not about self-esteem or empowerment when we talk about twerking, for example. When rates of dating violence, teen dating violence and in intimate partner violence and a shadow pandemic of sexual violence that has um, been exacerbated by the pandemic, as well as adverse childhood experience are so high for black women in the US and around the world, our music must begin to tell us stories that are not just about lust and coercion. And here I'm referring to the song Lust from Kendrick Lamar's Pulitzer Prize winning album, Damn, which the hook, all the hook does is say, let, let me put the head in, which is a grooming tactic for sexual co coercion. It's, on, it's being authorized by, the, by a Pulitzer Prize to audiences, um, further perpetuating the notion that m music may not be violent. So music has always been an instrument of vocal grooming between clans or groups. It's an evolutionary adaptive strategy. It bonds us. Music sound builds trust, not just for team Rihanna or team Chris. Um, music ultimately um, plays an instrumental role in repertoires of emotional, psychological, linguistic, and cognitive violence against Black women and girls who are rel relatively absent from the music and tech boardrooms, the coding rooms, the rooms that are figuring out how the algorithms work. Um, but they are very present, Black girls and women, in our bedrooms and on our handheld mobile uh, in our handheld, mo handheld mobile distractions. Music as an instrument of violence undermines reality like gaslighting and seeds violence against women. So I want to take a moment to uh, have you write a thank you letter to your body. Yes, your body. Your body has seen you through it all. You might have had or do have feelings of anger, resentment, disappointment, or frustration towards your body, for the way it has looked, for the things it hasn't been able to do, for the places it's been. But through it all, it's still here, your body, supporting you, allowing you to hear or even love the sound of my voice, feel my passion and purpose, be inspired by listening to these arbitrary puffs of air 
and the pops and hisses from consonants and vowels that make up symbolic meanings in language and communication in musical and non-musical contexts. Thank you, body. Thank your body for its interoceptive awareness, your eighth sense that translates feelings into emotion, for ringing the alarm of intuitional fear found in a, in a facial scowl, vocal he hesitancy, and manipulation from gaslighting. Don't be so sensitive. I was just joking. Um, or I could quote another uh, Kendrick Lamar song. I could quote, uh, long as my bitches love me, I don't give a fuck about no hate as long as my bitches love me. Perfect pentatonic scale by Lil Wayne on a song called Love Me, released on Valentine's Day on YouTube in 2013, um, that talks about shut up and don't make a sound, long as my bitches love me. We wanna thank our body for ringing the alarm of fear for the proximity of a predator that announced to your body, not your nice girl mind, the threat of emotional or physical harm. Your body and its interoceptive senses are designed for your survival. And I would assert that like bees, music can disorient people from their nests, from their places of survival. Your body can protect you if you know how to listen to the internal signals between your organs. Heart racing, to not pretend that you're afraid, to not act like you're strong, to anticipate when you're starting to get upset or overstimulated. You want to thank your body for breathing and doing what it do, for dancing like no one's watching and feeling when, you're, when you are not being you. Warning, this might get a little emotional. And that's the point. Sexist music is and has been muting us, muting the spectrum needed to protect ourselves and listen to our internal messages that come and are primed and psychologically repeated over and over again in the musical sound that we grow up with, particularly during our teenage years, which also predicts some of our political values. If you've read Derek Thompson's um, Hitmakers book, it's a great read, the chapter on music as sound. And so music becomes as sound an instrument of violence and bodily and sensory, tr sensory trauma. If you've been in a relationship and it didn't go well, you can tell me what song really helped you through. Um, and at the same time, you can tell me or I can tell you the songs that were used to lure me into romantic traps. So the emotional, Shirley Chisholm, one of the first people to run, women to run for uh, the presidency here in the United States, once said that the emotional, sexual, and psychological stereotyping of females begins when the doctor says, it's a girl. So I would assert that sound is an inescapable condition of life. There are times when exposure to sound is harmful. Noise from or orchestral to rap music can damage sensitive structures in the inner ear that connect to parts of the brain that process hearing, listening, and even balance. The ringing and buzzing sensations that we often hear, I have tinnitus, um, are signs of noise-induced hearing loss. There are situations or ecologies like Orange Theory Fitness, where I work out, in which sound causes harm to our hearing and ultimately can affect the way we think about ourselves in the world and our mind. Compressed sensations and the muffled sound that stem from an imbalance between air pressure in your middle ear and in your external, sur and in your external surroundings during a takeoff on a plane are signs of stress on your eardrum. The barrow trauma is what they call it. But we just think, ah, you know, once the plan lands, lands, we're no longer affected. But over time, these forms of slow violence take away your hearing, your senses, your sensory perception. So this book analyzes and uncovers how Black girls' online bedroom play, their dance play, 
is being played, getting played, getting plays for other people and how it's sexualized and exploited in a wickedly complex and, sh and shareable spaces, the shareable spaces of YouTube. Girls user generated content is being played by ordinary users comments, predatorial subscribers gaming the system for views as currency or playlists for currency by intellectual property rights holders who track, block, and monetize uh, sexist and non-sexist music forever in an intention economy that exploits very young girls, twerking videos. And they exploit it by the way that users create metadata and the titles as clickbait, thumbnails as clickbait, um, and a complex system of monetization and advertising that aids and abets Google's search engine, its recommendations, and even Vivo channels distribution. All of this rides on the back of underage girls' user-generated content. So uh, one of the arguments that I make, um, this is a good screen, you may, you might want to take a screenshot of this and not read this while I'm talking. This is a slightly different tangent. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I am looking at is this kind of way in which the skin we are in is a boundary between our interoceptive perception and the way that we're always constantly focusing on our bodies, given the way that we process what's going on in the environment about beauty, about uh, body shaming, about um, a dance. Um, it's all a way, a, a front-facing way of dealing with the world that may be muting how we deal with the world internally. Um, so to better understand how the larger music industry and technology companies economically exploit black girls and women uh, and how user interactions between user-generated content on, on YouTube's platform um, aids search, monetization, and music creators. Um, I focus on about the 200 songs that were involved in the data set I collected, um, mostly copyrighted songs, 200 uh, minus six by women, uh, by female artists. Um, there's about 12 songs in the entire data set by artists like Nicki Minaj, one by Beyonce, one by Ciara one by an artist from Chicago named Katie Got Bands, a queer artist, uh, an alternative rapper. Um, and we identified all of these by using music discovery apps like Shazam and Soundhound. Um, the names, yeah, let me skip this. So um, Girls Bedroom Musical Play and our fan searches are getting digitally, are, in a process of digitally grooming, pimping, and playing girls. Everyone but the black girl benefits commercially from the digital interactivity that happens on YouTube. The structure of the information communication technology and the user communication. This includes the user interface featuring the view count and thumbnails up and down, uh, 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 not thumbnails, I'm sorry, thumbs up or down gestures, thumbnails, of black girls' asses, young and old, um, as the thumbnail that on the recommended videos it may come up if you're looking for, say, a popular song like Booty Hopscotch by K Styles or Donk by Soldier Boy. The digital traces of our human computer interfaces and the algorithmic bigotry and oppression, we are aiding and embedding with our clicks and swipes and our eyes and our attention on YouTube. The code that generates recommendations and autocorrect is being shaped by our interactions with YouTube. The black boxed personal, supposedly disaggregated data collected on the backs of little girls twerking content, which would be illegal if it wasn't online. It would be child sexual exploitation if it wasn't online. We are aiding and bending by our participation in these platforms. Um, there's a wonderful book called Data Feminism, the authors of which I can't see my book close by. Um, they did a whole series during quarantine on their each chapter of their book, and they refer to some of these phenomena as big dick data, or the god tricks of patriarchy online. And worst of all the interactions to me as an advocate for black girlhood, 
is the sexually objectifying comments, the anti-Black misogynoir that's generated mostly by male users below their videos, where everyone else witnesses the shaping of the ethical, the ethical disconnects of adultification bias, hypersexualization, and empathy gaps, which no one, if they do report it, it reflects on the girl in the, in the frame. It doesn't reflect on those users or like the guy who's trolling this, this session. Um, they can remain anonymous, but girls' videos remain on the platform. So since June of 2013, music streaming downloads that track, block, and monetize sound when a girl uploads her video, twerking video, is fingerprinted by a content ID system that um, shapes billboard charts, Nielsen ratings, and the Recording Industry Association certification of gold and platinum records. The system of sexual exploitation for girls, particularly very young girls, trapped in musical play, in their own bedrooms and who are getting further played on behalf of a patriarchal industry where 2%, as you know from the Annenberg study, if you've read this Annenberg gender inclusion study, 2% of all of the most popular songs, maybe two to 4% are produced by women from 2012 to 2018. Um, that number is far less when it comes to black women as producers. Um, the same goes for video directors where white and male directors dominate the images, uh, produce the images that we dominantly consume on YouTube and other platforms. Directors like Diane Martell, a white woman who produced Blurred Lines with Robin Thicke and Pharrell. Um, she also produced Can't Stop, Won't Stop by Miley Cyrus. Um, this blackfished break, this is when Miley Cyrus was, was taking her blackfished break from her double life as Disney's teen star and singer, Hannah Montana, when she turned 21. Black Girls Twerking is being played by Vivo, an award-winning entrepreneurial venture fathered by the Universal Music Group. Back in 2007, Universal Music Group's former CEO, Doug, Doug Morris, I'm not sure if he's still the CEO, testified in Congress about rap music and said that sexually exploitative rap was essentially autobiographical free expression. Bitches just be like that. A hoe is a hoe. That's what I would say is the translation. Um, and he said that I will not infringe on my black, I'm paraphrasing, on my black male artists freedom of expression. Why? Because the internet. YouTube, began in 2005 and in 2007 people like universal the heads of universal music group knew what was coming even though they were complaining about the theft of their music from napster black girls were being played while songs were getting played and streamed by the consolidated um, surviving three major recording labels by independent male youtube music creators like soldier boy and k styles who has uh, the most songs in my data set uh, among teen and tween girls, songs with names like Booty Hopscotch. By using Hopscotch, you are targeting girls who are very young. Trampoline Booty, uh, Hands Up, Get Low, which seems to signify off of a girl's game song, which was um, called uh, uh, Gigolo. Um, my hands up high, my feet down low, and that's the way you jig a low, jig a low, jig, jig a low, a low, jig, jig a low. So my hands up high, my feet down low. The song that K Styles is probably most known for is Hands Up, Get Low. Um, and so every time a girl uploads a dance video, those dance videos, why the dance videos trend and are viral and people try to engage that as artists is because they make much more money off of those videos than they do from their official music video, even with millions of views. So it's hard to, uh, and uh, for Booty Hopscotch, the hook on that song is keep that ass jumping, keep that ass jumping, keep that ass jumping 16 times. That's the opening of the song. We're training and ingraining this music 
in very um, provocative and simple ways in a kind of attention dopamine high. So it's hard to tell you how many black female creators have made it big on YouTube, like Soldier Boy, Tiger, Justin Bieber, or the few visually Asian black sound of Jenny Iko or Chloe and Hallie. They are exceptions, not the rule. Now, I wanna note here an aside, there's a very, very famous black YouTube creator who is a black woman, Issa Rae. Um, she had a musical satire series and she has a new production company which is featured on HBO with the Black Lady, uh, the black lady Sketch Show. She had a musical satire series called Ratchet Peace Theater, which I have one of the videos of. It's no longer on YouTube. Uh, with episodes where she unpacked with deep tongue in cheek the lyrics of trap songs like Juicy J's Bands Will Make Her Dance. She's like, why did I go to college when I could have just shaked my ass for bands of money? <laughs> so um, mega artists like Miley, Taylor, si Taylor Swift, and others like Juicy J exploit the halo effect that adversely affects Black girls who twerk. Even artists like Nicki Minaj, Rihanna, Lizzo, with her fly virtuoso flute playing ass <laughs> who is fighting against fat shaming. Uh, she was in the news cycle here in the US just the last three days, or even Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. Everyone profits but the everyday black girl and woman, particularly white women and black men in the industry or particularly in user-generated content. Miley profits from a twerkathon on the MTV Music Awards in 2013. Remember I said 2013 was a pivotal year. Miley broke the internet that year three times, first twerking in a onesie on Facebook in February, second, her wonderlanding of black female bodies in her stage performance at the MTV Music Awards in August, then in December, where she topped the charts again with the new system, the content ID system on YouTube that fed Billboard and Nielsen ratings. She, was, she had a number one hit three times that year because of that new system that uh, was registered most significantly by the Harlem Shake uh, in the middle of the year. Um, and there's Juicy J with his $50,000 scholarship song and contest late in 2013. And a song he released in 2015 called Mary Mac. Scholarship, his song Scholarship was promoted and bumped by the fame, into more fame by twerking videos. He did a collaborative contest where he asked girls to upload videos on twerking, on world star hip hop, the Sharkisha video site, Shock site, and YouTube, and thousands of girls, over 6,000 videos I found on YouTube were uploaded. And just by uploading it, you lost control of the image as part of the so-called contest. Um, most of those videos on the world star hip hop platform for the contest have been removed. Um, so this massive archive of YouTube that has become a babysitting site for parents, that is the world's largest digital playground with its massive role in internet society, is doing what it does on the backs of Black girls and women, particularly, as well as all femme bodies that are disparaged in one way or another. It happens in the way it bakes this information into the search results and into the fact that YouTube is the number one music discovery channel on the internet because of Google search. It bakes itself into music and gaming videos and search recommend, uh, recommendations, all to mask the habituation to violence against Black girls and women that's epitomized in the misogynoir, grooming, and gaslighting of Black femaleness which began, if you do not remember, with the launching of YouTube. YouTube began with the three PayPal founders, uh, former, former PayPal employees and founders, because they couldn't get their dating site, which is how it started, to launch. And how they figured that they could get real attention was to post Janet, Jacks, Janet Jackson's Nipplegate from a year earlier in the Super Bowl which helped them launch their platform. Um, so it's the world's largest digital playground. It grooms and gaslights black femaleness 
as if it's an interface that helps music and tech companies win. And why? Primarily, it kicks, uh, excuse me, I want to make sure I say this correctly. Is that where I want to go? Okay. So by, by spotlighting the harmful white supremacist patriarchal structures of domination that surround Black girls' online play, um, I help people see what is right beneath our noses on our phones. Um, the wickedly complex entanglement of music technology and online sexualization of girls obscures not only the role music plays as violence, but it also hides its long-term consequences on the most vulnerable, marginalized participants in music making from childhood, black girls' hidden musicianship and taste making in the public domain that is then exploited by emerging artists like Nelly back in 2000 to gain attention in a noisy marketplace that is policed, that has policed the innovations of black music, beginning with blues and later with sam sampling. The costs, not just the bottom lines, the monetary bottom lines, but the unaccounted for immaterial labor found in the interactions, these complex interactions between music and tech, between girls' bedrooms and uh, the notion of empowering yourself uh, by twerking, reveal the blurring, not only of publicity and privacy, when while being young, gifted with dance and black and female, twerking at the intersection of home and work, but also the labor and leisure collapse and collide that happens in girls' bedrooms. If girls are, have some of the highest rates of intimate partner violence and dating violence before the age of 16, according to our, the US um, CDC, um, where can they hide? They can't hide in their bedrooms. They can't be at home. They're not safe outside. Bedrooms, in fact, are highly segregated spaces here in the U.S. when it comes to race and sex, I would assert probably around the world. These complex ecological interactions reveal how, the blurred, how blurred the lines are between value and vulnerability, between being essential to music making and being exploited as black girls are in these musical spaces. Like Nipplegate, or if you recall, the alien song to Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive, this animated feature that was viral before the internet took off on uh, YouTube, which is found on YouTube by Victor Navone. Black female figures have become object lessons of misogynoir and the interface of a technocultural system of patriarchy and white supremacy that wreaks havoc for some black women who are groomed from girlhood through music and offers monopoly for others, everyone but the most vulnerable black girls and women. Structural domination lives, according to Bronfen Brenner's Ecology of Human Development in the interactions. It also lives in the epistemic silencing and the epistemic repertoires of musical violence those intersections pronounce, amplify, and feed. Often the feed is black and female bodies, and the shit that comes out is misogynoir manifest in all the way turned up sounds of our oppression. Thank you. Please everyone, microphones open and clapping. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can think of no better way to cap off um, a day of popular music studies than with a talk as important as yours and with a demonstration of um, how uh, gracefully you dealt with um, what we just had to deal with. Um, do you have time for a few questions? I do. We're already keeping you longer than, than we said we would. Um, so let's open the floor. Uh, if you'd raise your hand, please, if you have a question. Dr. Gaunt is kind enough to stay with us for a while longer for a few of those. Stop sharing our screen. I'll try to kick it off with a short question because I found your, your lecture so relevant and so interesting. I can only second what Dr. Cinelli said, but 
You know, I was just thinking about, it's interesting that we have a body of scholarship about the bedroom producer, and of course that's already gendered and, and sexualized in some sense, and our students read about the bedroom producer as a sort of opening up of DIY spaces for music making. And so it seems implicit in what you're doing, the, the bedroom dancer or the, the bedroom play space, but I just wonder if you can reflect upon that, that dichotomy of the, you know, the male image of the bedroom producer versus the bedroom dancer as a feminist space. Oh, Jesus, hold on. <laughs> And I wanted to stop using this because I'm also audio recording. But go ahead. You were, yeah. uh, if you can sure. backtrack. Yeah, no, I was, just, I was just wondering <laughs> if you could reflect on the image of, of the bedroom producer versus the bedroom dancer or the, you know, the bedroom as a space for play, which then becomes mediatized. Is that something you've thought about? I just, yeah. it, your talk provoked the image in my mind. Yeah, I have. Um, I've been thinking about the way that kinetic orality, I don't talk much about it in this particular talk, but this concept I talk about in my first book of uh, the hidden musicianship of black girls, kinetic orality, how they pass down musical ideals of musical culture and musical blackness through word of mouth and word of body that is overheard on the playgrounds back when, um, that are appropriated by uh, male recording artists often to launch emerging artists careers back from Nelly, back to the 1950s actually, it, that I outline in my book over a 50 year period. So I, I've, I've been interested in, so that, that, that has always led me to this one question, which is why aren't, I mean, we all know the answer to this, but it's such a poignant question. Why aren't more girls, black girls, producers, of music, not just embodiment, which they are outlining. They're outlining the rhythm section that producers produce in the studio. They're outlining it. If you see really good twerking, you see that they're crafting the nature of their bodies to the sound textures that they feel, sense, and understand from a legacy of learning a litany of dances throughout their lifetimes whether they are from the Caribbean, Africa, Latin America, or the US, black and Afro-Latino girls know how to work their body like it is song production. So why aren't more? That has to be because of the interactions in the outer world, the stuff outside their body. So when girls upload their videos, they usually do shoot and upload videos. They don't, don't do any kind of tinkering. It's changed as more of the mobile handheld apps do this kind of technology for you. And some of the early, you know, we hear about, if you know about bedroom pop, we hear about artists working for Kanye, making all their music on their iPhone. So why aren't girls practicing what I like to call cookies in the hood? And I mean the hood hood. I don't mean the hood hood, I mean the vagina hood, the clitoris hood. <laughs> and why aren't they practicing more music making? So there's a silencing there and there's a silencing around domestic dating partner violence. And there's a silencing of women's voices generally throughout the world. Pick a country. <laughs> when it comes to the political sphere, it's absolutely apparent that that girl is not to be trusted, not to be listened to. Once you call women bitches, hoes, thoughts, chicken heads, and then they start calling themselves that, I just cannot understand. Uh, there's a wonderful article called The Social Harms of Bitch. Um, uh, if I can send, you can look it up on Google Scholar to find it. And one of the arguments they make is three scholars do this work about you know the soccer team, the female soccer team members who say, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, ace that bitch when they're talking about a test," and that women are using this language so that men feel quite comfortable about using it <laughs> because women use it. But what they argue is that there's no organization when you get in trouble, when you actually experience harm, political or physical or emotional harm. There are very little, very few organizations that an eight to 12 year old girl is gonna go to, to protect themselves from the online harassment or the violence or the manipulation or the doxing 
or the revenge porn that they will have to deal with. Mostly kids, when they have contact with adults online, never, 60% of them generally, never tell their parents. Why? Because they're gonna lose their phone. That's what they think. But the thing about the bedroom pop, you know, I just think we need to be advocating for girls to take the songs that they dance to and use GarageBand to try and make that beat. We've got some time that we need to make up for. It reminds me of Curie Miller's work on DIY ethnography, that, that you need to make it so you know just how sophisticated that production process is. And you can see the gap and you know the distance you need to cross to get there. And it's not hard with today's technology. It really isn't. But you've got to give some concern, the same kind of attention you give to dancing, to making beats with external parts of your body, right? Your mind, how you work the, the controls on the, on the board. Um, and it wouldn't be very hard to do this with very young girls or adult women. I see the project that's being done here in the States. We have a project called the Willie Mae Rock Camp for girls in which girls and adult women come together and they allow teen and tween, cis and trans and um, uh, ab asexual girls to come together and make their own songs and learn an instrument like a punk band, right? For a week, they write their own songs together. Uh, I was one of the mentors a few years ago. Um, they're about to change their name, but but uh, they're located throughout several locations here in the in the United States. Um, we need to do that around hip hop, and we need to confront artists like Drake and Lil Wayne about the flippant way they talk about how they exploit Black women's bodies in their music, and the way that they promote Kendrick Lamar coercion in their lyrics, and that. I can't understand why we haven't made this connection between consent and the lack of participation in the recording studio of women. There, there is a connection there for me. Long-winded answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Nora, please go ahead with your question. I mean, what you're referring to right now is a lot with, you know, why representation matters and why internalized oppression matters and, and a lot of other very important you know, aspects that also intersectionality helps us shed light on. So what would be your recommendation on um, facilitating active change here? The first is um, awareness, right? We're, we're, this is so wickedly complex. And to write simply about twerking and twerking as a dance and a bedroom play practice will not allow us to see it because of the way that people, uh, our, our perception of black girls is tainted by adultification bias at the, at the onset, even among, even among black women and girls. You know, those of us who are more conservative, uh, like I, I like to joke that I have all the parts, but I don't know how to twerk. And some of that has to do with the, my generation, but it also has to do with I have a reputation to uphold. And I say that, I've just seen this pattern where we, we take adolescence, pre-adolescence and adolescence to late adolescence, 20, 25. And we don't emphasize that you don't own anything. You don't have anything to lose. <laughs> you don't have a reputation to lose, but you can ruin your reputation. And that this is not about black girls per se, it's about everyone online, but black girls are the canary in the coal mine. So first we gotta get aware, right? You gotta, what they say about all addictions, you gotta admit there's a problem here. The second is we have to do little things like, um, my students do 10 vlogs in a semester where they just do vlogs of their personal reactions. So we do really good collaborative ethnography. And there was a black woman in one of my classes who was like, oh, can you code for like intention in her vlog? And she's like, I mean, like, I mean, are they intending to be sexual or are they just playing? Are they, you know, and then there's another student who's like, you know, I was doing my homework 
and my mother, he's a uh, Bangladeshi. He said, when I first heard of, of twerking, I thought it was whores. And so I'm collecting the 10 videos because he had never seen it before either. But he had heard, right? The internet passes those messages around. And he's c collecting his 10 videos and his mother walks by his bedroom and, and she says, Shafi, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, like, and so they get to write about these moments. And so for me, this project is, I'm thinking that, um, who's really inspired me, whose book really inspired me, uh, was another Miriam Prize winner, um, Tommy A. Han, who's the SEM president right now, her book, Sensational Knowledge, where at the ends of the chapter, she has these little pragmatic, practical things you do. And I've been using this drinking ritual between her first and second chapter. So I'm thinking that there'll be little episodes where I'm like, this is what you do. Go back, do a vlog of the song, You Came of Age Too Sexually and do a react video of yourself with it, with your adult eyes, 25 or 50, and ask yourself about how the things that you learn as you grow older with wisdom about structural oppression and structural domination might have been at work on you. But I can't tell you that. You have to do that yourself. This is, this is why it's not inherently the technology that is a problem, it can also be part of the solution, right? Making React videos, like I, I make React videos showing the ways that Eminem's guilty conscience is still being perpetuated as violence among React videos or Extentacion's content that still lives on the platform um, while he was murdered in a weird situation, which I won't comment on because I don't, it's not nice what I have to say. Um, there are thousands of mom react videos where guys are trying to justify to their mothers that they love XX Tentacion's misogynist texts. And they call their mother, bruh. What, bruh? You don't like that, bruh? Bruh? Uh, white and black moms. Mother and uh, a father and daughter watching Guilty Conscience together and having no reaction, like no sense of how this would impact you as a sexual being in your relationships if this were you, a 15 year old being drugged. Just no reaction. We are the sexist, misogynist music is muting our interoceptive survival instincts. Ren, please go ahead with Thank your question. You. Uh, yes, um, you already mentioned TikTok uh, like a, a little in a little bit in the start of the lecture um, and your analysis really goes into YouTube with the content ID and how that exploits uh, the situation economically because the music uh, businesses are just now just making money of these videos due to the content id system so i wondered if you had any thoughts about exploitation specifically through tiktok lens because it is a, a little bit of a different system yeah I'll, I'll zoom out a bit to any of those uh tiktok offshoots whether it's on youtube instagram facebook these little six second 15 second things um as i was preparing for this uh I was scrolling through my history to find a video that I wanted to perhaps show. And there were like a thousand of those videos on my YouTube thing. I had gotten in a wormhole with the little, with the stories on YouTube. And I thought, my God, like, just think of the scope of the time. We only have 1,440 minutes in a day. Think how much immaterial labor we're giving away to these platforms where our attention and that conversely or perversely, it's conditioning us to tolerate, to be habituated to all forms of, you know, nobody was harmed. I didn't feel it. So for TikTok, uh, there's a new book coming out by a guy named Trevor Buffone. I just reviewed it. 
uh, it should be out in a month, I think, uh, called Renegades. Uh, and actor Jalea Harmon's choreography of Renegade. It's a high school teacher with a PhD who has been making TikTok and Instagram videos and dub smashes with his black female students primarily. Uh, and it's a really beautiful book. Uh, um, Trevor's not a black woman or a black person, but this book is, is beautifully written and beautifully done. Uh, and I know he'll get some pushback because we're just really in a binary moment where everybody's like, if you're not black, you can't do, or if you're not American, you can't act in a black movie. <laughs> like we're just all over the map with binary bifurcations, which is the root for me of the dilemmas that we're facing is that we can't hold the complexity of the inter intersections. We can't solve the problems. Um, the, the weak signals that happen. There are weak signals on YouTube, but those weak signals are training people in billions of bedrooms and places on their devices. Why I say weak signal is because they're not authorized effectively, you know, your attention. It's kind of like water. You don't, it's like air. You don't pay attention to giving your attention away. It's a weak signal because white people are the majority on these platforms. It's just a numbers game. It's a numbers game, at least in the US and Western context. It's a numbers game. We are not that, there's not a big enough demographic to shift that context. But look what the gen, what is it, the gen Y? Look what they're doing on TikTok. It's pretty amazing the political stuff that they're doing on TikTok. So, you know, it's, it's both good, it's a spectrum. I, I just really want us to embrace more spectrum language that it would be like an equalizer where there's, <laughs> there's, there's two things happening. It's not either or, it, it's what Patricia Hill Collins, sociologist calls the matrix of domination. It's, it's, a, it's a matrix. And what we need to do is help people map that out so if you had a, a concentric spheres on a thing and you said, this is me, and this is how much time I spend on the platform, and this is how, how much money that YouTube video, that music video made, and these are the people who probably made money off of it. And, the, and then when you put it in that spectrum, in that ecological spectrum, then we can talk about the ecological fitness you need to have to be online. But we can't expect children to get there, right? I mean, young children. We can, we can expect 13 and 12 year olds because they actually are hip to this on some level. I think we're denying the evolution of learning that every, those of us who teach, every semester the kids are smarter. <laughs> I don't care what they, their habits may be poor. That's a function of the attention economy. But they know more about the internet they don't know more than us per se. They just know that they've spent more time in their lives delving into the interactions that we don't have to. And that's why I do collaborative work with my students. You know, I would just recommend, is it Ren, that you know, if you can do collaborative work with friends, because every one of your phone devices has different, you know, results. So if you can see, but everything is changing on the interfaces. YouTube used to have the top 10 videos. So you could say, do all, like if you can see the, the Brady Bunch, six of us on the screen, if we all search for the same thing, will we get the same results? The same top 10 videos. Until we do that, we can't get our hands on the problems because we can't see it. We, we make it personal, right? It's wonderful with a room full of popular music scholars uh, to hear how we can help you with this work in collaborative ethnog ethnographic I, ways. I might uh, be doing some like Wikipedia edited funds. I think I might, that might be a good <laughs> way to do it. It's like this day we're all going to meet online and we're all going to like see what we learn from our searches. <laughs> yeah. Like searching the latest pop song that came out. <laughs> 
You've got a team of 64 people right now that are willing to help right. you definitely there. And you've given us so much today, so maybe we'll we'll make this the last question. Nanriti, can you pose the last question for the day? Oh, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, I actually just wanted to ask you because I'm actually working on an essay related to the topic you spoke about today. And I wanted to know, like you mentioned earlier in your lecture about artists like Lil Wayne or Drake, and most of the artists you mentioned were Black. And they have all not helped, but just stopped and put an impact into the adultification of young black girls. Mm -hmm. So when do we begin to start holding these black men accountable for their actions and how do we successfully move forward? Because it's not just other, it's not just people of different races that are holding us back, but our own people are holding us back as well. So how do we move forward from that? Yeah, uh, once again, you know, like, um, uh, in sociology, we like to say we don't, it's not about the individual, it's about the group the individual represents, right? So in and of itself, Drake, Drake could be any other person. <laughs> he just happened to be the one who became famous that people love. But I mean, in another time and place, in a decade from now, there'll be another Drake, <laughs> whatever it is, right? So it's, it's, once again, it's about the intersections and the interactions. So if you can take, if you can make a composite of like a, a timeline or, or a case study for, let's look at Lil Wayne, Drake, um, Kendrick Lamar, all of these luminaries and compare what's happened with the engagement by women who twerk. So, so you could, I, could, I could actually make my 200 song database public to you all and you could play with that, right? So you'll know who the artists are. And you want to say, well, how does that map on to festival lineups? How does it line up with um, producers from the Annenberg study? How does it line up with the unregulated spaces of user-generated content where uh, what kinds of songs come up that are giving so many views to those artists? They too are on... on there is an ethical problem that you're pointing to, right? And as Dana Boyd's book says, it's complicated. But so is my checkbook. <laughs> and once I start dealing with it every day, like looking at how much I spent and how much I made and who I paid and who I didn't pay, I've been doing this this year. I'm like, oh my God, this is very apparent and it's not hard to manage. I can't fix the big thing. I can only deal with my weak signals that I'm not paying attention to. But I gotta see how um, interoception, um, th this is the very creative part of my mind. It's the artistic part of my mind. I'm just making these connections that they, they don't line up linearly quite yet, but I know that they make sense. Um, so interoception, is only registered, um, how I discovered this was from a dating violence site called Sparks. How your emotions are formed are based on the talk, the signals between your inner organs. So how they had studied whether girls had self-objectification about their bodies, particularly girls who had uh, anorexia, was they asked them if they could hear their heartbeat. When I read that article seven years ago, I couldn't hear my heartbeat. I'd never even thought about it. I, I said to an administrator I know from the University of Chicago, who I, who I interact with on a regular basis, I'm like, can you hear your heartbeat? She says, no. Oh, she didn't even check. <laughs> she didn't even stop and listen. So the theory, this comes out of autism research, is that the way that your emotion is formed is that you have to have like, a racing heartbeat and one, at least one other organ telling you that you're either scared or excited because a racing heartbeat could mean that you're scared or excited. It could mean that you're sick. It could mean anything. So you need the other organs, your skin having goosebumps on it. That's your skin is one of the organs to tell you I'm in fear. But if you're dancing to music, I don't think I don't think Lil Wayne or Nicki Minaj, I don't think most people get the connection with 
human sensory from skin to heart to uh, sweaty palms to having fun on a dance floor and that two signals can be happening. You can be both threatened by a boyfriend on the dance floor and love that song, but later hate it, right? So it's, it's I, I'm hoping that this book will help people slow down, think uh, that artists and for me, public health policymakers will be like, we need a sound public policy. We need, a, we need to limit the amount of attention given to sound on our senses and our eyes when it comes to kids and adults, I would assert, but definitely kids under 13. Even the American Pediatric Association says you shouldn't be listening. Kids shouldn't be on a device for more than an hour before the age of three. They shouldn't be on it at, at all before the age of three and only an hour from three to three to nine or 10. That's not happening, especially during the pandemic. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's the personalization of blame is the booby prize. It's the wrong turn. Blaming Drake or blaming, it's just the wrong, wrong street. But asking ourselves to question those things, asking if we could have gotten Nelly to come talk to the women at Spellman back in 2004 when he recorded Tip Drill, maybe life would have been different, but he refused to, to talk to the black women at Spellman, this historically black women's college. And he's still blaming women for not allowing him on that campus. So I, I'll leave it with this to say, um, everybody ain't you. This is, if you know hip hop, you know Joe Budden. Everybody ain't your motherfucking demographic. So we leave them alone. We let them be. And you do your work. <laughs> you do your work. Don't try to convince anybody. You just say what you have to say. Say it with your work. And, and this is a, a great place for me to wrap it up because I have denied my voice around this work. I denied my voice around my first book. I'm an only child and I grew up with a lot of adverse childhood experiences around sexuality, around my onset of sexuality. And I still experience a great deal of anxiety and fear about not being heard. But what I know is it's not unique to me. When I'm out in public and some woman says, excuse me, and I didn't even touch them, like, I'm like, I'm sorry. And I'm like, what? I didn't, I'm, I'm signing my check over here at the bank. And this woman's like, am I in your way? And I'm like on the other side of, and I'm like, oh my God, this is pervasive in patriarchy with femme bodies and, and children who are not allowed to honor their interoceptive awareness that they want to go to the bathroom in, in K through 12 education. You have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. That's your interoceptive awareness telling you, you need to go to the bathroom. And we're denying, we're dampening it down everywhere. Don't listen to your inner, inner signals. And so this is a book very much for me about voice, about political agency, about owning your relationship with yourself, not, own, uh, not owning your body. I think that language is really tr troublesome to me. Bodily autonomy is not about owning my body. If you cut me open, I don't have ownership of my body. <laughs> That's it. And I don't like the plantation-like language of owning your body. And so with that, you know, this has been a complicated process. It's taken me a while to just have the courage to wait for how it all merges together. It's, t it's been two years of pondering, there's something here. And it was the autist autistic um, angle of interoceptive awareness that pulled it all together, snapped it together for me. So That's thank you, everybody. Our, 
microphones <laughs> and let uh, Dr. Gaunt's distant body hear the sound of our appreciation one more time. <laughs> It's been a beautiful talk. It's been a beautiful day. Thank you for everyone who contributed uh, to the session today. Particularly, uh, let's open our mics and thank Nora for amazing dealing with our Zoom bombing. And <laughs> I'm so glad we were able to continue. And it's, it's all because of your uh, your improvisational skills there, Nora. That was fantastic. And for I'm the mad. Whole... I want to come work with you all. <laughs> and, and you got to invite me back when we when they let us out of our cages. <laughs> we absolutely, will absolutely. <laughs> so, and thank you to the IASPM board. Thank you to uh, the the local organizing organizing committee: Talitha Barrels, uh, Paul Kelly, uh, Nora Leidinger, and Ilsa Klassen. One more time, thank you for everything you did for an, an amazing day. Um, Dr. Schiller will say a few words uh, to finish off the day. No, really, I'm just going to keep it very short. I just wanted to thank you all for being here today in the name of the IASP and Benelux board, in the name of Arts, Culture and Media BA program and the Popular Music, Sound and Media Cultures MA program. You've done such an amazing job. Compliments to all of the presenters. Uh, the student presentations have been uh, honestly, better than many of the professional ones I heard at professional conferences. So you've done an amazing job. Uh, it was such a wonderful day. And even though we had a bit of a hiccup in the end now, I think the keynote lecture made up for everything. It was fantastic. Thank you all for being here. And everyone have a wonderful weekend. Bye all. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Gunn. Have feeders in. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Thanks again. <laughs> Bye. See you on Facebook. Ciao.